Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. We get a lot of angry comments on our war film analysis series saying that if we weren't at the battles we're talking about ourselves, we shouldn't be commenting about them. Which is really strange, especially if it's a comment on a World War I video. Which basically narrows it down to two people on Earth with the right credentials, Vampire Nick Cage and Vampire Comrade Putin. But even if I were alive back then, you wouldn't find me anywhere near the trenches because I'm a complete coward. I wouldn't be 10 miles within range of the trenches unless I were in some gigantic exoskeleton suit. The problem is, which battle suit? I mean, we don't really have any battle-ready exoskeletons here on Earth yet. Uh, so I guess we're just gonna have to look at movies and rank the top 10 exoskeletons in sci-fi films. Probably one of the most realistic applications of an exoskeleton in a movie is the P5000 powered workloader used by Ripley. Now this machine is mainly used by the heroic boys and girls in the Colonial Marines to lift heavy munitions and move them around. Even though it's technically not designed for combat, it's still formidable enough to take out the mother of apex predators. This was an extremely impressive machine that could carry up to 4,000 kilos. When converted to standard measurements, that's around 7.1 gallons. That's a little less than two F-150s, which in metric is about two Fiat fullbacks. So why is Ripley's forklift power loader thing one of the most realistic exoskeletons on this list? Well, because of the biggest limitations that battle suits here on Earth face is our limited energy sources. I mean, Raytheon developed an exoskeleton around a decade ago, and it looks just like the things we see in sci-fi films, except for the fact that it's tethered to a giant generator. We also talked about jetpacks in one of our last episodes. We've had the capability of making them since the 50s, but the fuel source was never able to last longer than a few dozen seconds. And because battlefields are far from controlled environments, the last place I'd want to be is an exoskeleton with an unreliable power source. Factories or warehouses, on the other hand, usually have a good stable power source, which makes them kind of the perfect location for the type of exoskeletons we have the technology to develop. As a matter of fact, a much smaller version of Ripley's power loader is being used already in factories in Korea. Just South Korea. The North Korean ones keep on killing the operators. I believe that's North Korea. So there you have it, reality mimicking fiction. While a lot of people hated the third Matrix, I was way too young to understand why when it first came out. I was too busy focusing on the awesome armored personnel units used by the brave human defenders of Zion. These were incredibly badass looking exoskeletons armed with dual 30 millimeter chain guns. But in hindsight, looking at these battle machines, well, they just aren't that well designed. I understand humanity is not doing well at this point in time. There's only a few thousand of us left. We're living in a sewer system and we've got all tribal. And we also have limited resources. But you're telling me that we couldn't weld some steel plates on these exoskeletons? The APUs were almost comically minimalistic in design. With no protection, no advanced targeting system, no additional weapons besides the chain guns. And if they're trying to save weight to make these exoskeletons move faster, well, they did a terrible job with that too. The idea with the exoskeleton is it allows the wearer to carry more weight, more ammo, more guns, and more protection. In this case, it's only more guns. I mean, if you look at the human army during the machine war, they had exoskeletons that were fully enclosed, protecting them from... Well, okay, maybe they didn't do that great of a job of protecting them. But my point is these big, slow APUs, while extremely cool looking, were essentially just big gun carriers. Gun carriers that were extremely hard to reload. So what's worse than Matt Damon pretending to be some kind of champion for humanity? Well, it's Matt Damon with an exoskeleton bolted onto his spine, pretending to be some kind of champion for humanity. Matt Damon aside, the exoskeleton from Elysium is another extremely realistic model. It's actually partially based on a human universal load carrier built by Exobionics and Lockheed Martin. This is an untethered 85 pound hydraulic power suit that can carry up to 200 pounds and move around 10 miles per hour for eight hours. Although this prototype never made it to the battlefield, it's just an example of what humanity is capable of. Another cool thing about the HULC was that it was controlled by sensors that mimic the movement of the wearer without physical controls. Matt Damon's exosuit also does this, but through an extremely painful surgery process where a contraption is bolted onto his spine. I kind of feel like this process is not all that necessary, but then again, the HULC sensors sometimes misread the movement of the wearer, so who knows. The much more likable South African mercenary, Kruger, also wears a more advanced version of this suit. While this suit gave the wearer increased strength and endurance, it didn't give them any increased protection or firepower. 
The brave Space Marines of the RDA and Avatar are the true heroes of the film. They bravely volunteered, for a fair fee, to take the perilous journey across the stars to acquire resources in order to save humanity. Once they arrived on the beautiful world of Pandora, they unfortunately encountered savage, bestiality-loving blue monkeys. In order to protect themselves, they had to use the Amplified Mobility Platform. These were exoskeletons used for a variety of different purposes, from combat to heavy lifting. First designed and tested for conflicts on Earth, the AMPs were also used on Mars and other Terran colonies. The Amplified Mobility Platform was completely enclosed and allowed Marines to operate them without oxygen masks. Because they were designed for multiple purposes, the AMP had arms and hands that could use a variety of different weapon systems. They were also quite strong and able to lift up to half a ton. Although the operators were shielded from the elements, their front view screen was quite weak and could be penetrated by a thrown spear. Very few things can kill Tom Cruise permanently, thanks to his monthly donations to Scientology. But when Tom Cruise steps into a combat jacket, he's basically unstoppable. Ah! These are probably one of the coolest suits on this list, in my opinion, and that's because they have so many little bolted-on weapons. Although the suit comes in different variants, most of them are equipped with the FN Scar H, which is a conversion kit that allows the Scar to fire the larger 7.62 round. Upgraded heavier versions of the combat jacket had rail guns in place of the Scar. The suits also had additional bolt-ons like an auto gun, which popped up behind the shoulder. Although I'm pretty sure you'll lose your hearing if you have a gun firing right next to your head constantly. Some suits also had grenade launchers and even rocket launchers. The heaviest suits were partially enclosed by armor. The suits were also relatively mobile and even had a burst mode which allowed them to move at incredibly fast speeds. They also ran on interchangeable batteries, which was a good design. It should be mentioned though that these suits were incredibly difficult to operate. They basically had PC controls, which when mastered obviously were superior to console controls, but weren't all that intuitive for newbies. Most of the suits on this list so far have increased the wearer's strength, endurance, and firepower, but none of them have really increased the mobility of the operator. This is where the Delta VI Accelerator suit comes in. These impressive sleek exoskeletons allow the user to run at impressive speeds without limiting agility or function. The wearer was also protected from all sorts of damage from collisions to energy weapons. The suit also had an impressive arsenal on board, including wrist-mounted miniguns and rockets which probably isn't all that good for your wrist and joints in the long run. The helmet also could read the thoughts of the wearer. Not really sure how that worked, but hey, that's what movie magic is all about. Thank God the prawns in District 9 didn't come in larger numbers because they could have easily went from being refugees to invaders and eventually overlords. Their technology was clearly far more advanced than humanity's. The prawn biosuits were a perfect example of these aliens' technology's destructive capability. These exoskeletons are equipped with a buffet of destructive weapons, including arc guns, chain guns, missiles, and a really cool magnetic field gun that's basically the gravity gun from Half-Life. It can create a telekinetic shield in front of the operator that collects oncoming bullets, which then liberally redistributes to the gunmen who first shot them. The prawn suit had room for an operator, but also had an AI brain which could operate the suit independently. Batman's armored suit might not be enough to protect Ben Affleck from his own addiction to alcohol, but it was more than enough to protect him from Superman, which is why it ranks so high on this list. It's essentially a metal exoskeleton that covers the Batman's entire body. It's extremely durable and enhances the strength of the user. It's so powerful that with it on, Batman is able to hold his own against a weakened Superman and survive some blows from a not-so-weakened Superman. Although Superman claimed that he totally could have killed armored Batman even with a suit on, but he was holding back because he's a good guy. Well, until Superman does prove that he can do that, Bat Armor Suit beats Prawn Man Suit. From Mark I to Hulkbuster, Iron Man's suits exhibit a perfect balanced ratio of mobility, firepower, and protection. A lot of the suit's abilities owe its thanks to the arc reactor fusion drive, which basically gives the wearer endless amounts of power. Tony's suit also has some really innovative designs, whether it's the dual-functioning palm repulsors that serve as both a propulsion system and weapon. Then there's the auto-deploy system, which allows the wearer to equip the suit in mere seconds. Then you have specialty suits like War Machine, which is basically equipped with every small arms known to man. And then, of course, the Hulkbuster, which is one of the few things that isn't immediately flattened by the Hulk. While Batman definitely had some really cool gadgets, Tony Stark takes being a billionaire to the next level. While some might categorize the Jaeger as a mobile battle suit like a Gundam, I still consider it an exoskeleton, just a really large one. Although they came in all different shapes and sizes, the Jaegers all shared one common thing, and that was their connection to its operators. 
This is what allowed the Jaeger to fight so efficiently against all those nasty kaijus. These were extremely expensive weapons, costing easily around $100 billion, which probably means it's not the best use of money when it comes to combating gigantic monsters that are trying to threaten humanity, but it's probably the coolest. The Jaegers were humanoid in design. Although they all had weapons bolted onto them, they also had fully articulated limbs, which allowed them to grab, throw, and punch kaijus in close-range melee fights. Again, probably not the best design choice, but really cool. Early Mark I to Mark III Jaegers were powered by nuclear cores, which gave operators like Idris Alba nosebleeds. Later Jaeger models used digital technology, which didn't give their operators nosebleeds. Not really sure what digital technology means. Although Jaegers were stupid expensive to build and probably not optimally designed to fight against giant monsters, they proved to be a more efficient defense than a static wall. A lesson humanity continues to forget through the ages from Hadrian's to the Great One, a giant walking robot will always be better. Which is why Jaegers top our list at number one. Well guys, that's our video. Let me know in the comment section below what you think. Did I miss any exoskeletons that you really like? Did I get the order wrong? Or maybe you think I shouldn't be talking about these exoskeletons because I wasn't actually at the battles that they were in. So I, you know, I'm not qualified or something. Anyway, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.